Good afternoon and welcome to The Cosmic Influence. My name is Walter Cruttenden and I'm here with my co-explorer Kevin Cato. And uh, we work with the Binary Research Institute, as most of you know, and uh, we explore the possibility that our uh, sun might be part of a uh, binary system which causes a rise and fall of the ages over very long periods of time. And if true, then um, we want to give some credence to what the ancient cultures might have known. And uh, that's why we're interested in, in all sorts of uh, ancient phenomena. And one of the most interesting ancient phenomena is this uh, whole megalithic culture that was built sometime in prehistory. And today we have an expert in that area. Um, and uh, so do you want to introduce Hugh? Kevin? Sure. I think we have a little bit on your background, so just shut your ears while we give a proper uh, introduction of you here. <laughs> All right. So our guest today is Hugh Newman, uh, an explorer, megalithomaniac, and co-author with Jim Vieira of, of Giants on Record, as well as the author of Earth Grids in Stone Circles. And that's so the Giants on Record is your latest book, right, Hugh? No, the latest one is uh, the Giants of Stonehenge in ancient Britain. That's okay. this one. This has literally just come out like a couple of um, few weeks ago. Terrific. Giants on record actually came out a few years ago, um, and uh, yeah, actually this is another one. There's one called Geomancy as well, which is um, I've, I've done that. It's like a co-author um, with a bunch of other people, produced by Wooden Books. I think you know the Wooden Books. Oh and, yeah, uh, I remember your yeah. first little Wooden Book there. Yeah, the Earthgrids yeah. one. Yeah, so yeah, I've been a bit busy. I've been working away, you know, during lockdown, getting things complete. So that's nice. Fantastic. Good. Well, Hugh knows more about megalith megalithic sites than I even knew number of sites existed. Um, and so I, I want to talk about your new book and, and some of the uh, giant phenomena, but I'd also like to just have a little primer on the megalithic uh, culture and what it's all about, because it's, it's still a big mystery to a lot of people. And you've been doing this so long. So first, how did you get interested in this particular phenomena? And then tell us a little bit about your journey there. Sure. Um, well, the, the megaliths, that's something that I've been um, fascinated by for a very long time. I mean, being in Britain, you're kind of, you know, surrounded, you know, virtually everywhere you go, you're going to find megaliths, you're going to see them everywhere. There's you know, over a thousand stone circles, there's dolmens, megalithic chambers, single standing stones, everything don't you know, everything you can think of really. But um, you know, since I you know, when I was very young, my, my mum and dad used to take me oh. to you know, Stonehenge and places like this and Crete and to like, you know, Silbury Hill, even before I was born, was when my mum and that mum was pregnant with me, she was taking me around Wiltshire, where I live now, right near Stonehenge. And um and she you know and so that's so even back then but really i i came into it kind of from a as a subscriber to the unexplained magazine back in the 80s and 90s oh, yeah. and that was a classic british kind of you know weird phenomena magazine but that kind of had a lot about ancient sites in it and a lot about str this high strangeness associated with them and that's what kind of it kind of drew me in from that angle um, and also the crop circles were, were an intriguing phenomenon for some years. And now a lot of them are sort of hoaxes and man-made. But there was a very strange phenomenon linking them with ancient sites as well. So I was kind of into the more weird, weird side of things. And then that, as, as I've got older, I got more sensible and started studying it more, um, more thoroughly. And I know you have your uh, conference every year. I, I don't know if you had one during COVID, but uh, I. I attended there once in Glastonbury. It's quite a fantastic event. Um, and there you gather together people that s study this same sort of general topic from different angles. What's what's the intent there? Yeah, well, basically, we, we, I founded that in 2006 with John Martineau, who's the publisher of the Wooden Books, also a writer and researcher. Also, Gareth Mills, who is a um, he runs the, the Speak and Tree bookstores and he's also a researcher. And so he set it up really with the intention of, you know, because no one was doing it no, in Britain. No one's had an ancient mysteries kind of megalithic conference. And we were kind of all obsessed by stone circle geometry, and, you know, the 
archaeo astronomy and all these disciplines and you know, i like you know the geomancy and things like this all these disciplines often get ignored in the studies of um megalithic sites so we kind of thought we'd put something together but we'd also we decided we'd also invite academics as well as um alternative you know theorists if you like um to the stage so we create a kind of bit of a debate between the two sides if you like and nowadays we have like the, some of the big name archaeologists to come to our event now we managed to get a few really well-known people over the years and that's kind of opened the door a lot of these archaeologists and anthropologists wouldn't go near megalithomania they thought we were some kind of fringe kind of out there event we do it in glastonbury which is like the the, the super cool hippie town right. in somerset um but you know and actually it's become this kind of really nice kind of get together every year we do like four days of tours as well we don't we don't quit we kind of you know spend you know five six seven days together uh, you know during one event you know you've been to you've been it's to fantastic. one like, back in, it's yeah back in 2010 you were over i think and um and, and so yeah and now you know we've it's kind of reached this point where there's a really nice balance between the alternative speakers and the presenters and also the academics and everyone listens to each other and hears each other out and we feel we kind of you know we, we set it up with that intention and now it's really kind of grown into that quite solidly as like this bridge between these two you know megalithic worlds yeah i i know what you mean about it it was a subject that was kind of considered woo woo uh for you know back when we first met uh and yet nowadays it seems that it's more and more mainstream uh, interest and study there. And, um, you know, I really want to cut to the chase. What, you know, what were all these sites built for? What's what's the latest best guess theory? And and yeah. and when when was that period when most of them were built, at least in Britain, where you are? Yeah, I mean, the classic stone circles were kind of mostly constructed and you, it's quite a long time frame, actually. I think between about, I think the earliest kind of proper recorded stone circle, it was probably about 3,200 BC officially up in Orkney with the um, uh, stones of Stennis. And but that's a debate about that. There could be there's older sites, there's older like Long Barrows. We know they go back to 3600 BC, like West Kennet Long Barrow, also the Nap of Hower, also in Orkney's 3700 BC. But we also have older sites. I mean, even St Stonehenge, excuse me, <coughs> was originally marked by these huge pine posts 10,000 years ago. So the location of Stonehenge would be marked by wooden posts that old. We also have some anomalies, like in Ireland, we have um, uh, some of the sites up in Sligo. They're like boulder circles. So they're just placed boulders in a circle. Some of these are up to 7,000 years old. Mm. So the traditions go quite far back. And the links with megalithic building go much further back than people realise. But we're talking just about Britain here. When we talk about stone circles and megalithic sites, spread out from here like in france going to portugal and the middle east some of them go back like eight thousand years you know we've got megalithic constructions and then you have gobekli tepe and karahan tepe yeah which would go back to what ten thousand five hundred bc possibly older possibly you know even you know much a bit beyond that as well and these were clearly megalithic sites but these were quite different these were beautifully carved they were, they were shaped pillars rather than just monoliths like rough hewn monoliths um almost more so, advanced in a way yeah it's, it's almost like the, the the more advanced the beautiful stone carving was present in the earliest times and it kind of got less and less but but stonehenge is got is quite well carved i mean you can see that when you go there you can actually see the shaping on the stones it's almost like they've been softened and scooped almost like in machu picchu or you get in uh, as one quarry in egypt there's a shaping to the stones oh. almost like they've softened it and like they've flattened some sides and they have placed it in very specific orientations what their purpose is as you asked as well i mean that that's one of the, the big big mysteries that's what we're all, all all questing to find the answer for but there's a lot of clues there's obviously there's the monumental 
ceremonial religious aspect there's the archaeo astronomy the alignments the calendar using them as like calendars there's also the energetic aspect where you're fertilizing the landscape you know the work of john burke and catch halberg yeah. where you know they were harnessing the natural energies to increase fertility in the seeds crops and even the animals and so forth even the humans um there's also you know other ideas that they were kind of um used for acoustic purposes they were like kind of very much designed around the human voice um and you kind of if you build up enough sound levels there with drums and the human voice you actually go into like trance states and things like this and so yeah there's, there's multiple multiple reasons but one of the, one of the main ones is the fact that i believe and this is what john michelle my mentor was kept emphasizing is that they're like to maintain and enhance consciousness to maintain this level of consciousness not just by being in there and having an experience in there but just by the presence of these sites just by you know you're just walking around you see one of these things it makes you think it triggers something within you you question what's this what is this you know what's the shape of this what what's it orientated to and so forth and so there's there's different different levels of um you know ideas in the construction of them i believe yeah that that latter one about uh, uplifting consciousness is is interesting because in a way that is sort of uh the purpose of art you know to make you feel good and uplift you uh not not so much to change your consciousness although i'm sure that's the objective of some artists but um it it seems like the ancients were even more profoundly uh, interested in that topic you know especially when you look at some of the pyramids that were built about the same time that many of the megalithic sites were built uh, with their chambers you know what were they used for too uh, probably similar purposes don't know yeah i mean yeah i mean i mean i think it's the same kind of principles are kind of the fundamental principles are kind of at play everywhere around the planet i mean we just got back from egypt we just did a, a trip out there with a group and it just is astonishing you know when you look at the sheer magnitude and sophistication and the the abstract kind of design of like the interior of the pyramid you go inside it you think what on earth were they thinking this is not a temple this is not like a religious space this is like a as chris dunn points out it's like a machine it's like something odd it's like going into this like strange megalithic almost like a kind of warehouse with machinery kind of built into the construction it's very very odd and so you have like this really abstract artistic element to like places like egypt and stonehenge but also Quebecly tepe it's a very it's a, it is like art to me it's like it challenges you because you're trying to understand it you're trying to understand why they've got all these symbols these specific types of carvings in specific places in you know with specific orientations and using certain measurement systems um and things like this and i think they're you know the, the monumental nature of these is it's got all these different things but i think the artistic one is like something that most people overlook they just look at them they're looking for like you know answers or what's the energy like or things like this but actually it could be more like what you suggest which is more of an artistic kind of thing yeah well and i would think there's oftentimes things aren't built with just one purpose they're built with multiple purposes um and so yeah i gotta think it's it's a worldwide effort going at a huge scale and so it, it must have some great purpose that apparently we've you know we've lost whatever that reason is and we don't quite have those same values nowadays so uh, that's that's why i do lean towards this cyclical view of history you know i just really think we've forgotten something very very important yeah i agree yeah no yeah i'm fully aware of the, the whole your work and the cyclical nature of civilizations you know kind of reaching a peak then going into the dark phase and things like this and i think that's 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 relevant and i think maybe you know perhaps these sites were you know worldwide they were placed there to when they're at their peak of this kind of cycle of highest level of consciousness they realized they probably understood by just being in that space that being in that kind of mental space that they had to like say hey this is where this is what we've reached let's put this in stone so no one can destroy it so it'll always be there 
and it'll be the pinnacle of our civilization. Here it is. And then even if they, you know, get destroyed or the people kind of die off or, you know, different groups come in, that's always going to be there as a memory, as a kind of really, you know, uh, repository of knowledge, wisdom, mathematics, geometry, information. Yeah, and indeed, many, many of these sites have lasted. Um, although it's a shame to hear, I know when I was over there uh, visiting you, I uh, spent some time at Avebury also, and uh, you know, it's still magnificent to me. But to read that so many stones were destroyed by the uh, the farmers who thought that it was, you know, some sort of voodoo thing and anti-Christian, and therefore they had to to tear them down and destroy them. But it's, I think we lost something there. It does happen. I mean, if, if people don't know Avebury, I mean, it's, it's fascinating because it's such it looks such a large stone circle. We're talking, you know, like a ridiculous size that that it's it's you know it stretches over several miles, several square miles if you include the avenues. It's that big. It's, it's just the circle itself is so big. An entire village has been built inside it. You know, this this is like how crazy. And you've got two main roads going through the middle of it. There's a pub in there. There's like a post office. There's a car park, you know, inside the stone circle. And so, yeah, it's a remarkable place. And then the avenue stretch for, what, two miles, you know, to other stone circles. Within Avebury itself, if people aren't aware, is there's two stone circles within the larger stone circle. And each of those is about the same size as Stonehenge. You know, so the, so that, that gives you an impression of the, the magnitude we're dealing with here. Um, but I think, you know, it's not just about scale. It's about like kind of marking the landscape, almost like tattooing the landscape. So like as a permanent kind of feature, which is I think is part of the, the geomantic thing. It's, it's part of Feng, it's part of like a traditional Western version of Feng Shui that they're working with the energies. They're working with the cosmic energies. They're aligning things um uh you know to the the poles and things like this and to kind of create a very sacred space like a liminal space which may have only been used for very important occasions and things like this so i mean even the avenues is that avebury for instance they're the this they've kind of they've worked out that you know by you know digging down and seeing how much the uh, earth's been compacted and so forth that the, they weren't walking in, you know, these ceremonies or processions, whatever they were there, were not inside the avenues, this parallel row of stones. They were outside. People were walking oh. outside it. So they were always kind of on the outside, kind of not necessarily. There was there might have been a very few people, like a priestly elite or something like this, who were on the interior. But that, so that, that, that intrigued me because that, that, what's going on there? It's almost, um, you know, it can, could provide another purpose for what they were doing. Hmm. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, so, in addition to the uh, the sites, you know, that have been left for us to try to figure out, there's a myth and folklore that have also been left and passed down over the years, and um, some of the myth, uh, you know, relates to to giants, as you've uh, noticed and pointed out and written about, and I'm. I'm wondering, you know, what's what's that all about? I guess, uh, you know, the mainstream is still very skeptical of, of much reality there. And yet there isn't an increasing amount of evidence when you really dig. So tell, tell us what's going on. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the theme of this book. I mean, I mean, we kind of did we, you know, this this book here, the new one, Giants of Stonehenge and Ancient Britain, this is more. There's a lot of mythology in it. I mean, we go into the, we go deep into the mythology uh, and, and decoding it. And what what we found, I mean, just fundamentally, we found like a huge amount of accounts of actual giant skeletons. That's that's an interesting side to it, which a lot of people aren't interested in. And we understand that it's not everyone's cup of tea. We say here, but it's really interesting to us because it's like, hang on a sec, why isn't why isn't this in the history books? Just that, that you know, these actual physical remains that have been found. But what we found is is that where often these skeletons or bones are found are at megalithic sites. They're at mound sites, they're inside, you know, burial chambers, and they're kind of like an elite, like a king, like a priestly kind of royal elite or something like this, similar to what we found in North America. 
and with buried all this regalia and weaponry and armor and stuff often and things like this so there's an actual you know academic archaeological reports with these um being found very famous places as well but there's a myth mythological side of it which is often linked with the sites these are found at and, and other places where you know a, a majority of sites in britain i think a majority actually is they're said to have been built by giants you know this is the traditions these are the folklore this is like the kind of you know the parochial stories that, that go round and round in local communities but also on a much wider scale to the extent that the founding of britain the genesis of britain the kind of first ever kind of rulers of britain were always linked with giants they were either giants themselves like bran you know bran the blessed or albion for instance or they were arriving here and battling patriot giants who were already here like when Tro brutus the trojan and Corinius came over to try and defeat gog and magog and his tribe of giants down in the southwest parts of cornwall and devon um even to the point where we have uh, in london at the guild hall which is like this famous library with maps and old text and documents and things like this they have two effigies which have now become gog and magog not just gog magog but gog and magog and they're two giants and they're the protectors of the, the mysteries in london in the guild hall and they're paraded around uh london every lord mayor's show in the, every november and pronounced as the protectors of britain the protectors of the mysteries and things like this so these pageants have been going on these parades with these giants as the protectors and founders of britain have been going on for hundreds of years even there's there's one near stonehenge which has been going on since the 1400s where they've been parading a 24 foot giant around salisbury the nearest town to stonehenge which is really odd because the first ever recorded name of stonehenge is called the giant's dance now this this goes back to the welsh texts um also the history of the kings of britain written by geoffrey of monmouth in the 1100s um from the choreo gigantum which means the giants dance um and also there are traditions of other tribes of giants building stonehenge and things like this who are often based in somerset and they would come come east to kind of build such things and so it's very odd where you keep finding all these odd connections with giants so we kind of decided to go into it you know not just looking for bones and skeletons and trying to prove giants existed that's not really our intention what we're really interested in is trying to understand why this mythology and these legends and these local kind of stories are so prevalent everywhere and have been for so long and then we realized what the stories encode is geomantic information astronomical information and information about fertilizing the landscape and things like this so there's very specific information that's being passed down from generation to generation through the stories through the stories and like and and there's a i mean if you go into the bardic tradition you know it's very similar to the native american tradition where you have because bardics the bards are linked with the druids and ovates and things like this and they're very precise their stories and they're often they're rhyming sometimes they're not but they're very precise very accurate and the, the training of you know of how, how the way the druids used to do this like two thousand years ago was you had to put everything to memory it was a very strict memory and you have to remember every word every pronunciation every syllable super accurately and this because this is because different levels of people initiates would understand the full story people who aren't initiated would, would enjoy the story the peasants wouldn't would just get the kind of gist of it and things like this so there's different levels of information and we've found that if you can decode you know the initiate level kind of stories you actually find that there's very accurate information often with numbers mathematics astronomical alignments, orientations, placement of sites in relation to one another. And these are all encoded within the stories. And so, you know, it's just a matter of working that out. And we, we have to credit Anthony Roberts, who first introduced us to that idea back in 1978. Not then, I mean, we've read, read his book much later, obviously, called Sowers of Thunder. And he kind of realized there was a geomantic connection with these giant stories. And he published a book back then. And we kind of took that on board and we were kind of very inspired by him. He was actually a Glastonbury-based english person contemporary with john michelle we, we never didn't know about him until much you know till relatively recently and so there is a real geomantic kind of mythos ingrained 
within the consciousness of the British and the landscape and the ancient sites all linked with these giant stories. And it's just amazing how many skeletons and bones you find at the sites where these myths are prevalent. Yeah. So, so I guess to, to most people and skeptics out there, uh, it's the skeletons and bones that, you know, they, they want to see uh, to really sort of buy into this. And what do we have there? Because I, I assume it's not, not much because things get passed around and uh, destroyed. Yeah. And, uh, we do. I mean, in the book, we have we've uncovered, I think, about 200, 250 uh, accounts of giant bones, skeletons and things like this, and burials. Uh, more if you add up like, some of the accounts have like 10 skeletons are found and things like this. But many of them are, you know, we, I mean, there are a couple on display. There's there's one up in Thurska Museum in Yorkshire. There's an over seven foot skeleton. There's um there was one on display in London. There was certain. There was even a, a, a thigh bone, a kind of, uh, you know, a super large thigh bone on display at a place like the Guild Hall, where we have Gog and Magog, for instance, and things like this. We have numerous places. We, we we cover it all in the book. But there was you know graves that were dug up. They found these giant bones in. These are recorded by academics. These are recorded by doctors and surgeons and members of parliament and things like this. We have this brilliant account from Stonehenge, uh, just down the road from Stonehenge in Salisbury, um, where in 15, I think 1508, uh, Sir Thomas Elliot, who was a well-known author, writer, scholar, he was a member of parliament for Cambridge, respected voice at the time, obviously, and he, him and his father, they discovered this 14 foot, 10 inch skeleton with this strange book with strange text on the cover. They it was crumbled to dust. And also this great tin um, and lead kind of probably like five feet wide, sort of circular kind of tabletop lid with, with the same inscri- kind of inscriptions on it. And that's completely disappeared. But these were, and this was also witnessed by John Leland, who was a well-known author and writer at the time, uh, William Camden, who wrote Britannica and Britannia. And also Thomas Eliot, we must remember, he he, he, he kind of wrote the first dictionary, you know, th- you know, if you think, think about that. And so, you know, you've got like these kind of things, Very these incredible kind of people, people. In, 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 you know, involved in these discoveries and clearly I'm just writing it in all their books and in their papers. And like, look, this is what we found. This is it. You know, illustrations were made of some of them. Um, but what's odd that it was found in Salisbury is that this is where this pageant has been going on since the 1400s, where they paraded a giant around the same town. This 40 foot 10 inch skeleton was found since, you know, for 600 years or so. And so, Right. So what it's in going? the psy- do- psyche and the belief of the people. Yeah, yeah it's it's just it's just odd, and, and like, and there's all these connections, and then then it, then we found. I mean, we, you know, there's, uh, and also we found a nine foot four inch skeleton, also found it in the same area. Uh, in the, as reported in 1719, two different reports we found of that. Obviously, we haven't found the skeleton or anything. Um, and you know, and many more, many more across the whole country. We've, there's even a ten foot skeleton said to be found in Mays Howe in Orkney, a very famous megalithic chamber. And that was reported on, documented in a well known kind of archaeological report and things like this at the time. Um, and so, yeah, it's very odd. I mean, and and it's almost like it's it, it's almost like it's got a supernatural element where people actually do find appear to find these things and then they just mysteriously disappear into the ether and are forgotten about or a spell is placed over us and no one remembers or something like that it's really strange the whole kind of study of what we call giantology with tongue firmly in cheek um you know because it's kind of it has this kind of supernatural element which we we find it hard to kind of it's almost like the fairy realm where you can't quite grasp it. It's always just out of reach. It's just, you know, like this, it's got this elemental force behind it, which is, um, you know, keeps it out of the, the populace. But if you go back in time, you know, to the 15, 1600s and before that, giants were a thing. Everyone, it was in our, everyone's consciousness. We have the stories of Jack the Giant Killer. We have, you know, Blunderbore, the giant. We have Tom Hickathrift in East Anglia. We have Gog and Magog down in the south coast all over the world you have the biblical traditions you have the north american giants it's crazy over there i mean christ i mean we've got thousands of accounts and stories and things like that so what's going on you know and you know when you start looking into the extremely ancient 
record you know suddenly people like you know discoveries like the denisovans and homo heidelbergensis in right. south africa and europe many of these are over seven feet tall up uh, sort of just nine feet tall in some cases and these were human beings these were humanoids you know hominids on earth hundreds of thousands of years ago so it's not like um we're trying to you know push our point across and trying to prove giants existed in britain we're just you know, our, 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 we come in, we come in it from a megalithic and a geomantic perspective. That's our primary kind of angle. And we're just fascinated that we're finding so many accounts at the same time, you know, of these actual bones and skeletons, which seem to kind of, like I say, have this kind of strange reality that is really hard to grasp. Yeah. It's, I, I guess society just goes through periods of time, you know, same thing, uh, UFOs when I was a kid, if, you could hardly mention them without somebody saying you're crazy. You know, you just couldn't talk about them. And nowadays, it's like the government's saying, "Sure, they, they've been around a long time." You know, so uh, things go in and out of phase. I don't know why that is, but uh, I, I'm glad you're doing some real work to document uh, the stories uh, and put them in one place uh, so people can compare and. Um, and then also to document as much physical evidence as there might be. Yeah, I mean, it's this. I'll give you. Let me just give you. I just want to give you a couple of examples which facet which fascinate me, which are great. They're really kind of fun as well. I mean, if we go to St Michael's Mount down in the very southwest tip of Cornwall, it's a famous kind of mount in the sea. It's got like a chapel church built on top of it. It's got these stories that go way back, thousands of years. They talk about this forest that used to be surrounded by in legend, the lost land of Lyonese, where it's like an Atlantean legend where it got engulfed by the sea. Oh, yeah, heard and then they that. found proof. They've now found proof of these, like, these lost islands, and they found proof of this forest. Everyone thought they were just myths and legends. And now it's quite close to the mainland. And But the story goes that there was a giant called uh, Cormoran, and his wife uh, as well, who lived on the island, they built the island by bringing over granite from the local kind of, you know, Cornwall coast to build the island with. And all these uh, elaborate stories, it's so many stories. And this, and then you have Jack the Giant Killer coming in and defeating him uh, by using all these tricks and things right. like this. And eventually they kill him, you know, that's, that's as the story states. His wife brings stones over in her apron and this is another tradition we find all over the country in fact all over the world and this is something jj ainsworth my partner and i've been working on this or going off in a tangent with this where there's this mythos is a very ancient goddess mythos where it talks about these giantesses striding across the landscape with aprons with an apron full of stones having a specific starting point and an end point they're going to then somewhere along the way the apron string breaks and the stones drop or they trip and the stones drop in specific points. And they're always in dead straight lines. Oh. Like, so we're talking like the tradition of ley lines right. and we have other giants like Cormoran would throw hammers across the landscape as he's shaping the landscape and building, building things to another giant. And that would be always moving dead straight lines from one point to another. Then they would throw it in another direction to create triangles in the landscape and things like this. So we're talking about surveying now. There's like, there's like encoded information about very, very crystal clear surveying data and we found that everywhere not just in you know st michael's mount but then on st michael's mount so we have all these stories you, have, you even have alignments with st michael's mount all the way across the country dead straight line called the st michael line this is something you probably know about john michelle discovered this in 1969 and there's another alignment going across europe and it goes through Mont Saint Michel, where you have oh, other yeah. giant legends, where giants there would throw stones over to St Michael's Mount, and and things like this. So it's like what the, you know, it just keeps it just keeps expanding the more you get into this. And you even have King Arthur going over there to defeat the giant, you know, and things like this. And then and so on St Michael's Mount, you got all these stories, you've got all these alignments, things like this. And then an eight foot skeleton was discovered there in the crypt in this rocky area, it'll like be thrown down into this carved out solid rock part of the islands, carved out of granite. They built the crypt and the church above that. When they were actually building this, you know, back a few, about 300 years ago, this is when they found it. And this is not a sensational news story. This is 
published and is in all the National Trust handbooks about St. Michael's Mount. And they document it very clearly how tall it was, what was found, where, you know, it was reburied. And I actually know where the grave is on the island, but no one knows who this was. But, you know, again, you've got this elaborate selection of myths. And then there's an eight foot skeleton <laughs> like just in the place where the myths originate from. And so it just things like this. It's like you can't. It's like what do you make of that? And it's like you can't, you can't ignore it. Uh, but th that's the you know you, kind of to us that was a revelation when we're finding things like that, and then you find the same kind of thing in a hundred different places across Britain. You realise there's a story there. It's like you've got so we need to put this together. So myself and Jim Vieira sort of pulled that all together over the last few years, and and it's it's a really interesting story, even if you're not impressed by giant skeletons it's, it's a fascinating because we're digging out all these kind of stories that people probably haven't heard we, we've uncovered we've got texts welsh texts translated especially yeah. you know for the book we've got we found old super ancient texts and legends that are in these obscure journals and things like this that no one's ever uncovered no one's ever published before um we've been through microfilm in libraries and stuff like that uncovering you know various things and yeah it's it's uh it was a fascinating journey put, putting this book together and uh there's much more to it than meets the eye basically yeah sounds like a labor of love um let's remind people uh what your website is uh, just so they can find out information and, and get to the book there is it it's just megalithomania.co slash uk is it, it no nice. yeah megalithomania.co.uk um dot UK. and there, we've got a page on there just about the book but we've got uh, you know we've got the you know conference and tours and things like that that we do up there as well obviously but yeah and um yeah and the book yeah the book the G the the giants of stonehenge and geomancy everything you can kind of link through from there but it's all up on amazon as well and things like that yeah so um and uh yeah and if people want to i mean one of the one of the, the main places we we produce a lot of content is on our youtube channel we have a very large youtube channel with like nine nearly 900 videos or something crazy got some of you up there walter from your for time in, in the, <laughs> your lecture <laughs> So people can check that out. It's just Megalithomania UK YouTube channel. So people can go there. So, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot more to say, but there's, you know, I think people have got to kind of consider that there's, you know, different sides to the megaliths. There's like many different elements to, to when you start looking into this. So looking into the myth was a real revelation, especially because it's my home country as well. I kind of, it, it was kind of like um, a kind of very patriotic feel right in the book, if you like. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm glad you do the work you do. It's very, very important. Um, you touched briefly uh, on some of the older megaliths uh, like Gobekli Tepe. And uh, so moving out of Britain for, for a moment here, um, I, you know, when I was growing up, they basically taught you that nothing was older than Egypt. And if it was, it was, you know, very sparse or very primitive and, and that's it. And of course, then you find a site like that now multiple sites like that that are you know two to three times older than than egypt is um so i assume you've been to uh gobekli tepe or uh, yeah gobekli tepe yeah, i've been there yeah this that, that is i went there i think first in 2013 when i, I was fortunate enough to, to run a, a, a little group tour there with Graham Hancock and Andrew Collins. So we had a lovely, lovely oh, yeah. time all going there for the first time together, that kind of thing. And um, and that was a revelation. Yeah, for sure. Seeing that in person, we met Klaus Schmidt as well, which is very interesting. He's, he's unfortunately passed away now. Um, and the Beckley Tepe is, if people don't know about it, it's down in, I'm sure they do, it's, but it's down in southeast Turkey near San Liurfa. It's 10,600 BC at least. Um, you know, they think now that's the kind of dating that, oh no, sorry, 9,600 BC at least. And that that's the dating there. They're definitely confirming. Klaus Schmidt believed it could go up to 14,000 years old. He admitted that before he died. And there's many more enclosures that have not been discovered, but it's what else has been discovered in that area. I mean, we've been visiting a site, an unexcavated site called Karahan Tepe, again, since about, you know, 2014 or so. And we got to we actually know the family there we're going to, we're going to be going back there soon myself and jj just to kind of because they've now excavated that 
And what's being found there is not only is it contemporary with Gebekli Tepe, but they found remarkable things there that they found that they were working and carving directly into the bedrock and in a very profound, very abstract, artistic way. They weren't just creating these pillars like you get at Gebekli Tepe in all these different shapes and sizes, 3D reliefs. They're actually carving into the bedrock and blending the bedrock with a stone circle. So as you go around the stone circle at Karahan Tepe, the, the encl- one of the enclosures, which is actually larger than any of the ones at uh, Gebekli Tepe, um, as you go around where it's kind of blending into the bedrock, like the pillars are carved out of solid bedrock on one side of it amazing. With, the, with these megalithic kind of thrones between them. It's utterly amazing. And then there's this pit, which has got these 11 kind of almost like phallic, but almost like anamorphic, you know, six foot, seven foot tall pillars, monoliths inside them. And we didn't see any. I've been, I've visited there like three times in the past, you know, and never seen any of that because it's been covered up. It's been, and it's only recently been excavated. But we've seen, we saw T pillars sticking out of the ground when we were going there over the years. We've seen um, this huge 18 foot tall unfinished monolith down on the west side of the site. We've been visiting that as well. Um, and we've had tea and lunch with the family on the farm <laughs> many times. We also discovered a whole bunch of caves that uh, that even the archaeologists aren't even excavating, which have got perfectly carved out. This is on the other side. This is like about a mile away, but in the same kind of complex in the Tech Tech Mountains, um, which is like southeast of San Leo, for southeast of Quebec Li Tepe. Huh. Yeah, it just uh, boggles the mind. I, I guess Quebec Li Tepe is through uh through uh what do they call it sound uh, radar of the ground they know that uh, there's many more sites that are still unexcavated i think uh, that's right yeah 200 pillars uh, last i heard yeah that's right yeah there's i mean at um camera hand type there are known to be 250 pillars and much of it hasn't been excavated yet they're continuing excavation uh, early january onwards i think um and we, we've, we, we're going to go and visit there hopefully before that so we can actually get in, get into the site hopefully and sort of check it out. Um, but quite a lot has been excavated. Graham Hancock's been there. He went there a year ago when they were starting to uncover it. Um, but, yeah, but there's a whole bunch of sites there called, called the Taz Tepela sites, which means um, the Stone Hills. And there's 12 sites they're going to be excavating. There's a number of them. There's a place called Bonkok Lutala. There's... Um, Sefe Tepe, there's um, Alanya Hoyak, there's a couple of others, um, there's Haba Betsuvan um, as well, that, which is just south of Karahan Tepe. There's several there which they're starting to realize could be just like Gebekli and Karahan Tepe. And so they've just clocked recently that, well, this is like major, there's a whole civilization there, not just a couple of sites. You know, this is, this is, this is going to rewrite history basically when they realize there's more than two or three sites there. But actually our good friend, um, Chuck, who unfortunately passed away, runs the CF apps, uh, YouTube channel, uh, believes there's 30 sites <laughs> in that whole area going across a, quite a huge area from the area kind of near Konya, you know, which you've got Chattel Hoyak and a Sickly Hoyak in that area, all the way past San Liafa, all the way to Mardin and beyond, which is going further east towards Lake Van, where you've got sites like Bukok Lutala and things like that, um, which uh, they're finding all T shaped pillars, you know, the beautiful 3D relief carvings. And some of the dating could be older than Gebekli Tepe. And so, you know, this is like biblical, you know, in more than one sense. This is like yeah. the stories of the Watchers, the Anunnaki, the Nephilim, the Giants, if you like. And the fact is, this is the area, the traditional area, according to Armenian legend, of the Garden of Eden. And this is something that Andrew Collins has been writing about for many years. Um, and he's actually doing a follow-up to his book from the Ashes of Angels, which was published in 1996, about this because he predicted this was all going to be found there back in 1996. And that's when they start they, they discovered the first stone. The year they discovered the first stone at Quebecli Tepe, I think. So this is remarkable what could be coming out of there, and it, it, yeah. it's certainly a very exciting times. I, I know that some of the uh, much of Quebecli Tepe was purposely buried and 
Chuck took me through the geology there, how they can tell that by the stratification of the soils, et cetera. Uh, are the uh, are the sister sites? Are they also buried on purpose? Do we know that yet or not? I think so. Yeah, I mean, according to the archaeologist, yeah, the, he says that uh, yes, Kamehameha Tepe was deliberately buried, but it's not. You know, whoever you know, whenever they buried it a long time ago, probably they didn't bury it very well, um, and much of it is damaged. You know, it's in a pretty rough state, to be honest with you, compared to Gebekli Tepe, where it's almost like that was like fully renovated and repaired, and then very carefully buried. You know, it's quite a different feel and look if you look at them both. So Gebekli Tepe is almost pristine. You know, there's certain parts of Karahan Tepe which have been maintained in, in very good condition, but a lot of the stones have been knocked around, broken. You know, there's weathering on them and things like that. There's some at Gebekli Tepe that look like they're brand new, you know, yeah. but until we go there and take a look ourselves, we can't really comment um, too much, uh, but they're going to be uncovering more. That's the oh, thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, and some of the artifacts, which are now on display at San Lerfa Museum, are astonishing. There are, some of them are in very good condition. And so there's just, you know, we have to admit there's a civilization here which goes back to 10,000 to 12,000 years ago and it's, it was a very advanced stone working civilization and this is where agriculture began but it's almost like this was built and then agriculture kicked off you know these sites were being built it's almost like which, whoever which, these people were yeah, they came in it goes, triggered the whole thing. yeah it goes against history theory because supposedly you cannot organize large workforces to do big projects like this unless you have reliable sources of food and shelter and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, it just boggles with our uh, history theories. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, you're very familiar with the mythology in Britain and how that relates to the stones. Um, do they have uh, a rich mythology also in Turkey, has anybody done any work there to try to tie some of the local stories and legends to the actual stone sites? Um, th I mean, th there are elements of that. There are a few local legends like we have at Gebekli Tepe. I mean, there's we have the fact that it's called the Potbelly Hill or the Naval Hill, which is has been known about for a very long time. Um, and that's thought to be, you know, this tradition of finding the center, this kind of very ancient tradition, it appears, um, which we find in different parts of the world, especially as some of the statues have these sort of fingers going towards the belly button, the navel, yes. which is like we find at Easter Island, we find at Tiwanaku and things like that, obviously much later cultures. Um, there's also a wishing tree at Gebekli Tepe, this olive, I think it's an olive tree or a specific type of tree, where even before, you know, 100 years ago, potentially, or more, it could be go back thousands of years, that it, people would go there and tie ribbons to it and leave offerings because it was this wishing tree on this sacred hill before they even knew there was a site there. And so you got this kind of thing, like a, a memory of this. But when you start looking into the biblical traditions, it all it all kind of resonates there's something going on there so you're looking at you know very famous folklore if you like from the you know the old testament the book of enoch the book of giants things like this that kind of reference this kind of area and so yeah there could be something in that you know um if people need to but i'm sure there's more local legends i think they're just starting to emerge um not there's not much there because if they were they'll be so old they probably wouldn't be remembered that well. But I think it's a case of like, you know, when we go there, we're going to try and talk to some locals. We're going to have a chat with the, the farmers who own Karahan Tepe and, and see what we can find. Yeah. Yeah. It's too bad we've lost so much. Um, but your your point about uh, how some of the, uh, the myths were recorded very carefully, uh, we find that same tradition in ancient India when um, before writing, they, you know, were... Uh, reciting the the Vedas, and uh, people from different villages could get together. They weren't literate as we know about it, yet they could both recite the the Vedas word for word. Same thing with some of the Nordic myths. Uh, and so, yeah, it seems like uh, mankind was much more interested in in keeping this the memories of certain ancient things uh, intact. Uh, 
versus in the modern area where you don't have to remember anything because it's all on a disc somewhere. Uh, yeah, or... that, that that is a problem. I mean, I mean, like you know, people can't even remember how to drive from one location to another without a GPS and things like that. It's quite worrying. And <laughs> whereas, whereas these people were like, you know, walking hundreds of miles just to get water or some plants and things like that, and had to remember their way back across desolate plains or, or jungles in different parts of the world. So it was a whole different mindset, you know, and, um, you know, there was just much, obviously much less distraction. You know, we don't know, we are so fully distracted constantly. Whereas then they were observing any slight changes in the, the weather, the kind of atmosphere, the, the movement of the planets, the stars, the, you know, slight changes in even earth energies, you know, they could sense that in their bodies and things like that. It was a, it was a very different world. And I think it was, they had time as well. They had time to construct these sites very carefully, very thoughtfully, and very accurately as to how they wanted it. And they had, and they, they could have been a lot of trial and error, which they destroyed possibly, you know, so we don't, we don't know for sure, but I think there's a whole kind of side to ancient way of thinking that we, we perhaps really find it difficult to get our head around. Yeah. I'm sure of that, you know, in the Indian texts, they talk about these uh, four ages in the yugas. Each each yuga is, you know, one cycle of the ages. And uh, the, the Greeks called them the Iron, Bronze, Silver, and Golden Age, but the Indians called them the, the Kali, Dwapara, Treta, and Satya Yuga. And the period of time in which many of these megalithic sites uh, seem to have been built, uh, at least in Britain, seems to be the, the Treta Yuga, which is the Silver Age. And, uh, you know, if the lowest age is a physical age and all you can perceive is that which you perceive through the five senses, you have no knowledge of molecules or atoms or radar, or electricity or magnetism, you know, all these subtle uh, forces. And then, of course, in the next age up, the Dupara or Bronze Age, you you become aware of this whole fine world of final forces and start to develop these physics of uh, principles and things like this. Well, so if you know if the myth about this is correct, then in the higher age it's a mental age, and we associate it, you know, uh, with a period of wizardry and magic and and uh, telepathy and. Uh, things like this. Uh, and even Yogananda in his book, Autobiography Yogi, says, you know, uh, telepathy was then common knowledge, and don't worry, it will once again be common knowledge when we get back into the Treta Yuga in roughly 4100 AD is sort of our next period of time. So I think in order to really understand these cultures, we have to have that kind of mindset, and it's almost impossible to <laughs> to understand it where we are today yeah I, I i agree with you i mean people question how you know how old these these myths and stories really are i mean in britain for instance i mean there's you know could they be much much older you know and like could they be like um you know going back to you know tens of thousands of years i mean some people have suggested that i mean even even the myth of people things like jack jack and the giants and things like this jack the giant killer they're known to be at least 5,000 years old. There's some data and research done by academics on very specific myths and stories. And yeah. it makes, you know, I'm fascinated by the, the what you're talking about because we also find this, this idea of like extremely accurate passing down of information, you know, because people, are, you, know, it's, you know, it's like it has to be trained. It's like part of, you know, part of your kind of childhood is to train into this kind of, knowledge base and like you know so you just know it you know off by heart kind of thing and i think that's kind of what we we don't really we don't have that i mean i think our brains are just being overwhelmed by complete nonsense and it's, it's super frustrating so you have to kind of like dedicate yourself to kind of reading and remembering yourself and um yeah anyway i'm just um going uh, off on one a bit but oh, yeah i know what you mean <laughs> yeah we think we're at the pinnacle of technology but uh Maybe we're uh, we're just relying on it because we've forgot gotten higher and greater things. But anyway, I, I think we should probably get to the point of wrapping this up. And I, I just want to thank you, Hugh. Uh, it's it's been a long time since we talked, and you're as cogent as ever on these subjects. And I can hardly wait to dig into your new book. 
No, cool, definitely. And I've got a question for you, Walter. How did you find Kalanish? You went to Kalanish up in the Outer Hebrides, didn't you? Yeah, actually, my sidekick, uh, Donna, did that. She was just there recently, oh. and and uh, we're working on a, a film that's basically a fictional account of my book, Lost Star, Myth and Time, to uh, an archaeologist and astronomer. They fall in love and figure out this mystery Wow. Uh, but anyway, she was from Scotland originally, and so oh. she'd always wanted to visit there. And now that we're digging into the subject, she uh, she went there, and she said she just fell in love. That it was uh, she was there, you know, a lot of solitude, practically alone. And uh, I'm sure you've been there once or twice yeah. or more. So. Yeah, I've been there a few. I've been there a few times. Yeah. yeah. What do you What do you think of that site? Kalanish is remarkable. The Outer Hebrides, um, the whole kind of Isle of Lewis, all that, that whole area is, is, is fascinating. I was, I was fortunate to be up there in June 2006 um, when uh, the Sleeping Beauty phenomena was happening, the, the extreme uh, lunar maximum, I think it was, where the, the, the moon doesn't set, it rolls across this landscape, this mountain range, it looks like a, a reclining female figure and it rolls between the kind of curves of the female and then uh. and then rises again, so it's this remarkable kind of um, clearly that's what they were doing, building sites there to make, make these observations but yeah, we went there again last September I think um, or the September before um, and it was delightful. We went there for the equinox because there's there's alignments with the equinox up there as well, and there's yeah that, that is that is a special place. It's, it's similar to Orkney in some respects, you know, where you're just in the you know out in the ocean, like undisturbed by kind of society. You kind of get away from it. all. It's a beautiful place. Good. Well, I have to get there, and if if I do, I hope it can be on one of your tours or trips. <laughs> <laughs> so that about wraps it up. Thanks so much, Hugh, for coming on the show, and uh, hope to see you at the next Megalithomania. Thanks so much. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks okay. a lot. All right. So that's it. Uh, we like to say at the end, uh, let's uh, bring on the higher ages. So take care.